What is the world coming to? Wrestling for toilet paper? <laughs> in social media here, in the last 24 hours in Australia, there's footage of ladies fighting, wrestling with each other over this stuff. Toilet paper. <laughs> what have we come to? Well, what a year it's been. It started off with bushfires, devastating bushfires. And you can imagine the worry and anxiety that has caused. People lost their homes, people lost lives, and millions of animals were killed. Just devastating. Following the bushfires, some part of the country has now suffered floods. And we were in drought for so long. But now, there's just too much water. And there's been homes washed away and damaged by serious flooding. And now the world is suffering from coronavirus and we're yet to see fully how this will pan out. In our supermarkets, and in fact I've just been down to my local one a few moments ago, there's very little pasta, little rice, uh, some parts of cereal have disappeared, but particularly hand wipes, sanitizer and toilet paper. Very little to be seen. And in fact, in supermarkets, there's been queues at the door of the supermarkets before they open first thing in the morning just to get toilet paper. People have been fighting, wrestling with each other. There's even stories of someone pulling a knife on someone else to grab their toilet paper. And police have tasered somebody because of antisocial behavior. What have we come to? We've seen this sort of behavior before. Back in 1962, was the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world was fearful about atomic warfare and Americans filled their basements with tin food, water, ready for an atomic blast. Stephen Taylor is the author of a book, The Psychology of Pandemics. He is a professor and a clinical psychologist at one of the key universities. And he's made some commentary about this sort of behavior. This professor shares another instance of stockpiling and it's the turn of the millennium, the Y2K bug. Do you remember that one? Where people were worried that as the millennium came into effect, the clocks would turn over to zero zero and this could cause all sorts of computer glitches. It could send missiles flying, the global economy or stock markets could crash as a result of this glitch and people as a result stockpiled non-perishable items. The US government was also worried that people would stockpile cash, and so they printed an extra $50 billion worth of notes. Experts say that panic buying helps people feel in control of the situation. And I have to say that when I went down to my supermarket a little bit early today and found the last couple packs of toilet paper, I thought I'd better grab some just in case. Let me read you what Professor Taylor says. Under circumstances like this, People feel the need to do something that's proportionate to what they perceive is the level of crisis. We know that washing your hands and practicing coughing hygiene is all you need to do at this point. But for many people, hand washing seems to be too ordinary. This is a dramatic event and therefore a dramatic response is required. So that leads people to throwing money at things in hope of protecting themselves. David Savage, an associate professor of behavioral and microeconomics at the University of Newcastle, has written about this sort of behavior, about the rationality behind stocking up in a crisis. And he says that if everyone else on the Titanic is running for the lifeboats, you're going to run too, regardless if the ship is sinking or not, he says. The Bible predicts a time of trouble. And we see this in Matthew 24 and 25. And there's this parallel. Jesus talks about what's going to happen before the destruction of Jerusalem, but also parallels what's going to happen before the second return of Jesus. I think we can see how fragile things can be. You know, and for me, this has been a great learning experience just to see how things can quickly disintegrate in time of trouble. Well, should we be stockpiling now for the time of trouble? So if we believe in what the Bible says, and the Bible does talk about things getting worse in the future, how do we get ready for that? Well, the solution's not so much about stockpiling possessions and rations. It's more about preparing yourself spiritually for the return of Jesus. 
God's people will be plunged into distress at the end of time. And the prophet Jeremiah talks about being a time of Jacob's trouble. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, 5 to 7. Jacob experienced a night of anguish. And the Bible talks about a time where God's people will experience anguish too. Do you remember the story about Jacob? How he deceived his father to gain the blessing that was intended for Esau. And as a result, Jacob had to flee. He had to flee from his brother and escape his wrath and anger. After being in exile for many years, Jacob decided to return back to his native country. And there he was on the border of this country of his homeland. And he heard the news that Esau was pursuing him. He was coming to meet him. And imagine the fear and terror and anguish this caused in Jacob's heart. There he was with his wives, his family, his stock, his servants, defenseless before an angry brother. Adding to the anxiety and fear was the realization that he'd brought this on himself. It was his deception, Jacob's sin, that had caused this situation that now threatened his family. His only hope now was the mercy of God. His only defense was prayer. And in the darkness and solitude, Jacob humbles himself before the Lord in prayer. He humbles his heart. And there as he pleads with God, he feels a, a hand placed on his shoulder. Imagine the response, the reaction that this must have brought about. Here he was concerned about the approach of his brother. Now he's thinking that this was a threat. He was in danger. He thinks the enemy has come to take his life. And now with all his despair, he wrestles with this assailant. And as day breaks, this assailant touches Jacob's hip. And as if with supernatural power, he's paralyzed. Jacob falls weeping on the neck of this assailant, clinging to him, not letting go. Jacob knows that this is no ordinary person. Hosea refers to this being as an angel of the Lord. And although suffering with pain, he does not relinquish his purpose. The angel urges, let me go for day breaketh. And Jacob says that he will not let him go unless he receives a blessing. And this was not a boastful or presumptuous claim. Otherwise, Jacob would have been destroyed. Jacob had confessed his unworthiness, his need of a savior. Jacob had confessed his weakness, his unworthiness, and yet he trusts the mercies of God. Jacob receives the blessing and his name is changed from Jacob to Israel, meaning God contends or contends or fights. The devil seeks to discourage us and for us to break our hold on God. But we must cling to God and plead for his mercies, for his blessings, with a humble heart. And particularly at the end of the time, the devil seeks to destroy God's people. Just as he sought to use Esau to destroy Jacob, we're under threat. Isaiah 27, 5 Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. We need to take hold of the promises of God, to seek the Lord in prayer, to seek his blessings and not let go of the Lord. So what a lesson for us, not to get caught up in wrestling with people, not wrestling for things of this world, but to wrestle with God, to cling to God, not with arrogance, but with meekness of heart, to cling hold of God and his promises in his word, and he will deliver strength he will deliver peace that surpasses all understanding. And so we need to have this relationship with God today. And this then prepares us for the time of trouble, the time of Jacob that may be ahead. Here's one final verse from the Bible that can give us so much hope. And it's found in Romans 8 verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray just to finish. Lord, we're living in uncertain times. There's just so many things that seem to be happening. Fires and famines and floods, pestilence, all sorts of problems. Lord, the world seems to be filled with worry and anxiety. Lord, we do long for your soon return. But thank you, Lord, that we do have hope, that we are not alone, that you are there to give us strength for whatever we may face. And Lord, we can see hope, we can get strength from the examples and stories in your word. We can see the story of Jacob, that while he made bad decisions, and we make bad decisions, Lord, that you still loved him, and that you were there to bless him and guide him as he gave his heart to you. And Lord, we give our hearts to you today. We cling to your hope, to your word, to your strength, Lord. Don't let us go. Be with us, Lord. Be by our side. And we look forward to your soon return. Lord, help us to be ready for that day. Help us to share the news with those around us, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. And if you'd like to stay in touch, please subscribe.